Hello, I'd like to welcome you to our third week in the book of Genesis. We are in Genesis chapter 6, and uh, you should have already taken your quiz. And as we did last time, you can just turn, send those in to me, and we will uh, we'll grade them on this side. Those in-house, uh, you should have been able to grade those. Or if you've not been able to grade those, grade those during the break very quickly. Uh, but I do appreciate you doing that. And uh, we look forward to tonight's uh, lesson. As I said, we're in Genesis chapter 6. And uh, let's go ahead and read the first five verses. This is mainly where we're going to focus our uh, attention tonight. And then the next week we'll try to get through the remainder of Genesis five, uh, 6 and then on into Genesis chapter 7. But Genesis chapter 6, verse number 1, it says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, one thing I didn't mention a moment ago is uh, those online you should have received uh, about six pages of notes uh, for uh, through chapter five, uh, verse five of Genesis chapter six, and those in house you should have already been able to get those uh, because of Sunday night, or if you didn't, there should be a few more copies uh, at the back of the auditorium, or you can see David or Nathan, and uh, they'll make sure you get those notes. But uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into we'll get into our, uh, our lesson or our, our lesson tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, this evening. We thank you, Father, for your goodness and your mercy. Uh, Lord, what I have before me, Father, is, um, Lord, uh, there's, uh, this, is, this is a highlight. Uh, this is a, a high-profile event in the book of Genesis, Lord. This has uh, made a difference of a lot of things in the history of the world. And Father, uh, as well as there's even controversy surrounding it. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd give me wisdom. Uh, Lord, I pray that, Father, I would say what you want said this evening. Uh, Lord, uh, some of this, Lord, if, if folks watching, doesn't, they don't necessarily fully align with what I'm going to teach tonight. Lord, uh, Lord, it's, it doesn't break the fact of uh, the, the important doctrines of the Bible. And so, Lord, I pray, Father, that folks would have grace, they would have charity, they'd have understanding. Uh, Lord, if they don't necessarily agree uh, to, the, to the last T of, of what I'm going to say tonight, but, Lord, this is uh, based upon study of myself as well as what I've learned over the years. And, Father, I pray that you'd help me to present it in a, an informative fashion, Lord. We thank you, for it's in Christ's name. Amen. As I prayed, as you can fully aware, if you've, if you've looked ahead in the notes, you're going to understand that some of the things I'm going to point, point out to you, or going to present to you tonight, are things that uh, I've been taught years ago, as well as things I've, I've studied for myself, as well as others that have taught in the more recent uh, uh, history. And so I just I ask that you're you have an open mind to what I'm going to give you. If you walk away from this tonight and you say, I don't necessarily see things exactly that way, that's okay. Uh, but I would ask that you at least entertain me with an open mind and also let Scripture speak for itself. And that's very important. Uh, at the end of the day, what this book teaches and what this book presents, our word, the Word of God is truth. And... And at the end of the day, if we can agree on the, on, the, on the doctrines of the Bible and the way of salvation, uh, look, that, that's what's important. But I think we see some things that make a lot of sense. And so I'd ask that you just you, you'd bear with me. But Genesis chapter 6, uh, we've already read through the, through the five verses that we're really going to cover tonight. You're going to see, we see the fact that there's corruption on the earth. Now we were we were um, we were introduced to Noah in in chapter five. We saw there 
in the last few verses of, of chapter uh, 5 where it says, And Lamech lived after he begat Noah five hundred ninety and five years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were seven hundred seventy and seven years and he died. We, we pointed out the fact that everyone in that genealogy uh, died. There was death. And in verse 32, And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah, remember, Noah's going to be the one that brings comfort. And the reason for that is God's going to bring judgment, and there's comfort twofold. One, there is comfort when righteous judgment is given, and that's what God's going to do here. We're not going to get through it all tonight, but you're going to see the start of this in the introduction of it. You know, sometimes when judgment comes, it's a good thing. And in fact, it's always a good thing if it's administered by a righteous judge. And that's God. God, will not the judge of all the earth do right? And, and Abraham asked that question later, but that's what happens here. Noah brings comfort because one, comfort comes in his day because God's going to judge. But there's also comfort the fact that Noah is going to be used by God to save mankind, and it's also going to be a pure line of people. And we'll talk more about what, what that means in, in just a minute. So Noah is the, is the character, is the star of the show, if you will, in some ways, in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this chapter, and he will be for the next several. But we see the corruption. There's divine judgment that's going to come, and judgment upon the earth is going to fall because sin is the subject of of the next three chapters of Genesis. The reason for the flood is because of sin. The reason because of the judgment is because of sin. The reason because of all these things that's going to happen is because of sin on the earth. This judgment is frequently referred to as Noah's flood. You know it as that. And chapter 6 gives reasons for the flood and prescribes the rescue from the flood. That is, here's what's going to happen, here's the presentation, and here's why this is going to happen. Chapter 7 will give the details, followed by chapter 8, recording the end of the flood in those, in those occurrences. That's chapter 7 and then chapter 8. We won't turn to chapter 8 right now, but you see that in verses 14 through 22, where you're going to have the flood, the, the waters are going to recede, you're going to see Noah and his sons are going to come out of the ark, they're going to give an offering to God, and God's going to say some things that's going to change some things for later. One of those high-level things is capital punishment. Remember, Cain and Lamech didn't get judged the way we would be judged from the flood forward. They got to live, but there was a judge, there was a curse upon them. Now, this report is a strong reminder for mankind that the corruption of man eventually brings the wrath of God. Now turn over, if you will, to Ephesians chapter number five. Listen, man can only go so long before God is going to God is going to prescribe judgment upon him. Uh, you even think about right now, man, man thinks, and the Bible talks about how that because the judgment of some act is not given speedily, man thinks that God is okay with what he does. You see that today, folks, and I'm ad-libbing, but you see that today. The way people live, they think, oh, God doesn't care because, hey, you ever heard the, ref and I'm, it's a little nerving to say this, but you ever heard the, you ever heard someone say, well, if I'm lying, let God strike me dead. Let lightning strike me. If I'm, you know, it's like you're tempting God. You do understand that. Folks are, it's a little strange how people are. They, they, they got a very weird way of thinking that they think they can just say what they want to say or do what they want to do, and God's okay with it. But the truth is God's not okay with it. God's not okay with your sin. God do, isn't okay with you living in adultery. God isn't okay with you living in fornication. God isn't okay with you uh, doing what you're doing in, in wickedness. But He's a gracious, merciful God that gives and gives and gives a place and gives an opportunity for you to repent and get things right, and then you don't. And, and, that's, and that, that's where man falls. Ephesians 5, verse number 6 says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. The idea is, again, what I've just presented to you. Uh, all these things, that, and some of these things I just mentioned to you, from, Genesis, or excuse me, from Ephesians 5, 1 down through uh, verse 5, 
then Paul says, let no man deceive you with vain words because of these things, those things that are listed, verses 2 through 5, is the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. See, sometimes Christians, especially, and here's, and here's what happens. Young people that live in an in a, in a, in a, in environment, in Christian environment all their life, in church environment, may I say, they sometimes look out there and go, wow, look, Susie's having fun. Johnny's having fun. You know, Debbie's doing great. I can't do those things. Mom and Dad won't let me go there. I'm, you know, Mom and Dad think that because just because I'm 15, 16, I can't do the, I, I can't stay out to that certain time because, you know, they're just, they're just, they're just no fun. Well, the truth is, they know what's going to happen, whether they experienced it for themselves or maybe they were brought up the way they're bringing you up, but they saw friends or they saw relations that went through that, and they want to keep you from those bad things. But the, but the problem is, being in this bubble, and I think it's okay to be in that bubble, please don't misunderstand me, but that because of being in that bubble, you think, well, the grass is greener over there. Oh, it's wonderful over there. It's great over there. But you've not experienced, you've not lived long enough. See, here's the thing. There is something to be said, age brings experience. What you do with that experience is what's important. And age will teach you some things. And, uh, and young people have to understand that. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, verse number 6 says, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. Look, there's going to come wrath. The question is when. Sometimes people get it in eternity. Sometimes people get it while they're still alive. They, it, it, it hits them. But it's going to happen. And that's what's going to happen here. Uh, now, I know I said some things there that weren't necessarily in the notes, but I think they're worth saying because you're going to see some things here that are, that are probably going to be, wow, that, I never, never saw that or I never thought of it that way. But there's still some practical things that I like to point out as I go along because you've got to learn some things for your life. It, it, you can have all the knowledge in the world. It's like, yeah, this goes here, and I gap, and you don't gap, or I, I don't gap, and you do gap, and we've already dealt with that. But, and I do believe in those things, but you don't believe in those things. And you got all the book knowledge, all the, all the, you can have all the knowledge, but you also need to know, say, hey, because of my doctrine, because of my beliefs, it makes me live different. And that's where the practical comes in. And, and even here, you can see those things. But notice here the particulars of this corruption. And we see these verses 1 through 5. There was a multiplying upon the earth. Now, let me say this. The multiplying wasn't wrong. Because remember, Genesis chapter 1, uh, Genesis chapter 1 look at verse number 28. Verse number 28 here. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now, if it was just to stop there, back in Genesis 6, verse number 1, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. Stop. They haven't disobeyed God. They're doing exactly what God told them to do. In fact, we could go on and say, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every creeping thing. That's okay. Man's supposed to even do that today. That was one of God's purposes for man. So look, I've created this. You go and subdue it. You use it. You're good stewards of it. And enjoy it. That's fine. Up to this point, we have no problem with chapter 6. If it was to stop there, there'd be no problem. But there's a problem. Remember, remember the, the, the serpent in the, in the garden? Remember that serpent was used by the devil, whether he brought it forth or he entered it, whatever he did it. But there was, there was a problem. The devil wanted to mess up God's plan. He messed it up when he convinced Adam and Eve to sin against God then he's going to try to mess up God's plan. And I'm going somewhere with this. He's going to try to mess up God's plan because remember, God said that there would be a seed born into Eve that would save the people. There was, there, there was going to be some, a, a, 
something promised, that was a man that would come forth. If the devil can destroy this line, then he succeeded. And we'll go into how he's going to do that in just a minute. So, again, if we were to stop here, there'd be no problem. Up to this point, ver the verse here is obeying verse 28 of chapter 1 of Genesis. We're fine. But here's the problem. We see the corruption of the seed of mankind. They're, the devil's trying to corrupt. Verse number 2. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wise of all which they chose. Some people look at this verse and they say, well, it's the sons of God. And some have an interpretation of what these are. And we'll, again, we'll deal with this uh, in brief in just a, here in just a few minutes. But we see the sons of God saw these daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took wives of all that they wanted. The consequence of this is verse number 3. It says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. Now, There are those that say the sons of God is the godly line of Seth. There are those that say there's, there, there's a certain line of prince. Uh, and there are those that say these sons of God are fallen angels. And, and I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but at the same time, I think it's worth mentioning right now. It, it, if you prescribe to the first two I mentioned that they're the godly line of Seth, then what's the problem? Because here's, here's what we see in verse number 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became, became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. If those cause giants, and they cause these superhumans, and again, I'm jumping ahead, then one, why is verse number 3, why is God saying man that I'm only giving man 120 years left on this earth? And that's what's happening here. And then why is it when you have a godly line, because some will say, well, the, the sons of God are the godly line and the daughters of men are the fallen line. They're, they're, the, they're the line of Cain. And when they get together, they form these giants and, that's, and they form these bad people. One, why aren't we having that today? And two, if it's the godly line, then why, why, why the 120 years? And then why all of a sudden God's decision on these things? Now, let, let, me, let me get into my notes further. We have the sons of God. And, I, and I, what I say to you is that's the, sor this, that's the source of the corruption. On top of the fact that man is only getting worse and worse here, in the passage. I think you've got several things going on. You have the corruption of the seed of man and the devil's trying to fight this line that God's given with, where Christ is going to come. And also you have man just in general being evil and wicked. So we have, we have the questions. Who are these sons of God? Who are the, who are the, the, the giants in the earth? And how did these giants come to exist? Well, the Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. And we'll, and, and we'll, we'll deal with that a little in, that in after those days in, in a little bit. So let's identify these sons of God, these giants. The first mention of giants is here in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. The giants came from a union between the sons of God and the daughters of men. The second mention of giants on the earth is when the children of Israel were attempting to enter the land of promise. You, and that's where you see an after these days. After these days. Remember, look back again now at verse number 4. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So what you see in the passage is, in those days, that's the days of Noah, but after those days. So not only do you have these giants and these men of renown happening here, and that's what's one of the things driving God to say, I've got to destroy man, and start over, 
but you also have after those days. So where were those other days, after those days? We'll turn over to Numbers 13, 33. When the children of Israel go into the promised land, or they're going to enter, you have where they go to spy out the land, and they spy it out, and they get discouraged. They say, there's no way we can do this. We can't do this. There's, there's no way because of what we saw in the land. Number one, they were never told to go spy it before they entered it. God just said, go enter it. It's yours. Take it. But they said, no, 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 we need to go spy it out. So Moses gives in, and Moses says, go ahead. And they do, and they get, they get fearful, and, and they don't want to go do it because they see some giants. Look at Numbers 13, 33. And there we saw, and these are the, 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 the evil spies, those that bring the evil report. You only have Caleb and Joshua that says, oh, we can go up at once and take it. 33, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Now, some people will say, well, the giants of Genesis chapter 6 are the dinosaurs. Folks, I'm not even going to talk about dinosaurs today. What, you know, I have my different thoughts of what it, where, when did they live, where did they live, how did they live. We're not even going to talk about that. But here's the thing. We're talking about giants again. When God says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, that there were giants in those days, and then after that, those giants were from those relationships. They were people, but they were, their stature was larger. That, here's where they show up again. We're not talking about dinosaurs anymore. We're talking about these giant people. And this isn't the only occurrence in your Old Testament where you see giants. This is only one. Let's talk about some more places. You have the sons of Anak. We've already read Numbers 13. Look at Deuteronomy 2. I'm just, please, don't, don't cut me off yet if you're like, I don't, I don't think this is right. I don't, I don't agree with this. Just bear with me, okay? Um, Deuteronomy 2, verse number 11, it says, which also were accounted as, so now look at verse number, um, look at verse number 10. The Emims dwelt there and in times past a people great and many and tall as the Anakims. So you've got Anakims, you have Emims, which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emims. So you have all these Ms. We won't even read all of it because there, there's no sense in it. There's, there, there's a there's several that we could read about, but they were in that land. That's interesting they were in that land. And this is something I haven't really said in times past because I, I've, I've, I taught Deuteronomy uh, s several years ago. But it's interesting to me that they dwell in the land that was promised by God to his people. Isn't that interesting that they show up and s stay around there? It's just like, ah, uh, they're trying to stop something. Think about that. Just let that sink in for a minute. Uh, look at Deuteronomy 3, verse number 11. And this is what's very telling. Because you say, well, it says it's giants, but they were probably just maybe a foot taller. Because I've heard people say that. Well, you know, the Jews are just short. No, they're not. I know many Jews. There's some that are they're normal height. I mean, some people, it's amazing how people try to discredit the Bible. Because I remember years ago talking to family, talking to others. Well, they were just short, and they were just a little bit taller, so that's all it was, really. And, you know, they just... Do you know a Jew? They're normal height. I've got some friends that are taller than me. No. No. Quit. Stop discounting the Bible so it fits your narrative and it fits your brain. This book is bigger than us. Just stop. Take the book for what it says, unless it gives you a reason to think... It's, uh, it, it, it should be interpreted differently. Just stop. Deuteronomy 3, verse number 11, the Bible says here, For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Number one, his bed is made out of metal. But you say, well, mine is too. Not always in those days. This bedstead is a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabath of the children of Ammon? So they have this thing on display, apparently, or, it, or it's, they give a place where it's located. 
nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth thereof, after the cubit of a man. So if you do the math, and I don't have it all down here in your notes, but if you do the math and you, you figure this, it's according to the cubit of a man. The dimensions of Og's bed, this means that this bedstead would have been between 14 and 14 and a half feet long. Now, typically, uh, most men today are about six feet, maybe six two. Your beds may be six inches longer, maybe not even that sometimes, you know, but it's a little longer. But why, but I don't think there's a need for a bed to be 14 to 14 and a half feet long, folks unless the man sleeping in it is between maybe nine or ten feet tall maybe taller may, probably taller okay I mean think about it if it's 14 to 14 and a half feet the man could be as, as, as much as 13 13 and a half maybe closing in on 14 feet tall because he because his bed's that long he's probably not much shorter than that this is a tall man you say well that's not too bad I'm roughly six feet. You might be six two, six five if you're pushing it. But even if I mean around today, we think seven feet is tall. I've I've had acquaintances years past that. Seven feet. That's tall. I mean, I'm looking up like this. But think double that. Because remember, we're talking fourteen. Even if he's thirteen and a half feet tall, that's still double. Almost double. That's tall. He'd make a seven-foot man concerned because he's double his height. So this man's tall. And notice how wide it is. The width would have been about six feet. I, my wife and I have a queen bed. I, when I'm laying on it, you know, I'm close to the edge here. If I'm looking at something and I'm sleep, you know, laying across it instead of a long ways, my feet are hanging off. But... I mean, in that kind of bed, I would be, I wouldn't touch the edges. I'd be, or be touching the edges, but I wouldn't be hanging off. Folks, that's, that's pretty, pretty wide. I mean, that's the average height of a man. So this dude's, this dude's big. He, he'd have, he would have made NBA easy. He'd be dunking them, no problem. Walk up and go, boop. So this guy's tall. So, if this is any indication of what we're dealing with in Genesis chapter 6, we've got some giant people. So the giants in the land of promise. We see the children of Israel destroy the giants east of Jordan, but we'll face more of them on the other side. Notices, notice Deuteronomy chapter number 9, verse number 1. Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. Now, some people say, well, that's just, that's just poetic license. That's just the narrator using poetic license. You know, he's just, he's just elaborating. I don't think that's the case. Why would they say cities great and fenced up to heaven? My guess is that some of these cities, you have those giants, and if you're 13 and a half, 14 feet tall, you're going to have to have a fence much greater than you to feel secured. So to a six foot, six and a half foot tall man, not only are they regular walls, they're even greater than regular walls. That makes a lot of sense. And notice it goes on. A people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, whom thou knowest and whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak? Understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee as a consuming fire he shall destroy them and he shall bring them down before thy face so shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord has said unto thee. So it makes sense that these Anakims, if they're giants, that their cities would be very great and very tall. And that makes perfect sense. Joshua fights the son of Anak uh, the son of Enoch in the promised land in Joshua 11 verse number 22. Now notice some of these giants and where they're at. Go ahead and turn over to Joshua. I was going to skip it, but uh, but just for sake of context, I, I know um, we're taking some time here, but this is something that when you see it, it 
makes perfect sense in other places of your Bible, the things you hear, the read and see, and, and you start making these connections. Joshua 11, verse number 22, the Bible says, uh, There was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod there remained. Now, I give you this verse because you're going to see the children of Israel come in. They, they wipe out a considerable amount, but there's still some in the land of the Philistines. And they're still hanging around the land as thorns in the sides of the children of Israel. And it's not by coincidence. It's not by coincidence. And you see these here. And you're going to see some folks pop up later that's going to that's going to cause some problems the philistines so the philistines are going to dwell in the land of promise and these giants were in the land during the time of Saul and David and David will fight them as a young man and later as the king of Israel notice it says notice the cities again if you haven't turned away jo Joshua 11 verse number 22 only in Gaza and Gath and in Ashdod there remain now turn over to 1 Samuel 17 if that's the case, then this makes perfect sense that you have the Anakims, the Emims, the Zamzumims, all these Ms that are in the land. They wipe out a considerable amount of them, but there's still some hanging around. And then you see Joshua, they only stay in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. Then it makes sense now that you come down, to come down this line of people. You come down to David now in 1 Samuel 17, 4, we read about a certain man of Gath. His name is Goliath. And there went out a champion, 1 Samuel 17, 4, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. So this would have made Goliath between nine and ten feet tall if you go by the, cu the span of a man and you go by the fact he was six cubits tall. He is a descendant of all these giants and now he's fighting for the Philistines and he is their champion. And what does he do? God's line that, that his son is going to come through, David, the father of, from an earthly standpoint, the father of, the son of God, the, the grandfather of the line where Christ is going to come through is going to come as a champion of Israel to fight against the champion of the Philistines and you've got you've got the champion well, I'm just going to say it the champion of the devil and the world fighting against the champion of Israel and God's champion which happens to also be the line that Christ is going to come through and you got Goliath showing up which is down the line descendant of all these giants and they're going to come head to head in this valley and one's going, to, one's going to be a champion and one's going to die. And we know the outcome. And so David would go on to fight other giants as well. It's not just Goliath. You see, they have to be wiped out. They're going to be wiped out. Look at 2 Samuel 21. 2 Samuel 21, verse number 16 when you get over there. And Ishbod-Benob, which was of the sons of the giant, I believe that's Goliath, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. So apparently, we don't have all the details, but apparently he either went after David in battle or he at least had intentions to kill David and David wasn't around to be, to be slain or maybe he did go after David. But notice here, verse 17, but Ab Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, secured him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. So notice here, these things are going on. Verse 18, And it came to pass after this, after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibachai, the Hushathite, slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giants. You, you have these sons coming down the line that are that are also great in stature. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines where El Elhanan, the son of Jeroboam, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, notice that, the, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, 
the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a battle in Gath, where was a man of great stature that had on every hand, and this is crazy, folks, every hand six fingers, and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was born to the giant. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. So again, you see these people, these 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 superhuman, really, people that are popping up in the land of promise. Why the land of promise? Well, I submit to you, I think there's a reason for that concentration because there's something, when a land's special to God, then it's special to the world and it's special to the devil. Why the Middle East is so special, it, 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 it bogs the mind other than it's God's. It, the whole world belongs to the Lord, but there's something special about this place. So what is it? Then it's special to the devil because he doesn't like it. Now, there are three popular beliefs as to the identity of the giants in Scripture. You have the sons of princes, the godly males and descendants of Seth, and the fallen angels. And so let me take the next couple of minutes and then we'll take a break and maybe get through a little bit more of this and then we'll take a break and come back. But the three beliefs are this. Number one, the sons of princes. This belief is from a traditional view in Orthodox rabbinical Judaism according to a commentary on the Old Testament by uh, Kiel and Dilich is that they were the sons of princes. However, the above view requires such a stretch of logic like who are the princes, what were they, that that only a few hold to it today. It's, it's very, very few think that it's that. Uh, that there were some special line of princes. It's like, well, number one, where? We have no record of that. But it's just an explanation of, oh, they're the sons of God because, but what makes a son of God? We've talked about that before. And then you also have the godly line of Seth. And I actually know some people, uh, some of your really strong fundamentalists will, will hold to this because they explain it this way, that it's the godly line of Seth, it's the male descendants. Well, then I guess all women, there's a problem. No pun intended, folks, but, uh, you know. The popular view among Christians today is that the sons of God are the godly male descendants of Seth. Therefore, the female line is generally believed to be the ungodly descendants of Cain. So when you, well, all these women are from that ungodly line of Cain, they're wicked, bombable, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then all these males that are marrying are the godly line. And so when they get together, they produce this superhuman race. The intermarriage of these two lines, godly line and evil line, caused such a perversion in the race of mankind that eventually it brought about their destruction. This view proposes the following, that God had placed a prohibition on intermarriage between the line of Seth and the line of Cain, which we have no record of. Because of these unions, God determines to destroy the inhabitants of the earth with a flood. This intermarriage of godly men and wicked women resulted in giants who were mighty men, men of renown, according to Genesis 6, 4. At, le at the least, the intermarriage of godly men and wicked women produced super men, superior men. There's a problem with these views, though. There is very little support from Scripture. We never see where God prohibited the, the two lines to marry. None. It assumes that God placed this prohibition on the intermarriage of Seth and Cain, which the Bible never mentions. It also assumes that God would want to destroy the world based upon godly and ungodly people marrying. Well, if that's the case, then why didn't he do it again? You say, well, he is one day. But, it, but there's something greater going to happen when God finally consumes this world with fire. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Yes, wickedness led to the world in the day of Noah being destroyed. And I, and I agree with that. There was wickedness. But let's remember that saved and unsaved are like Mary today and they do not cause this kind of destruction and they don't cause these kinds of people. You, you don't produce these giants and men of renown based upon the unions of ungodly men and ungodly women. I understand God's command in the New Testament that, you know, that a believer and unbeliever shouldn't marry, but when they do, you don't see strange things physically. Uh, it doesn't happen. So that leaves the fallen angels. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a break and we're going to deal with that when we come back from the break and, and, and present that, that, that uh, side of the, of the option of what's going on in Genesis chapter 6. So let's go ahead and take about a 10 minute break. When we come back, we'll get into that on page 48 of your notes.
Thank you for joining us again after our break. Um, we stopped off on page 48 of our notes and we talked about the first two options of this uh, Sons of God and what we want to do now is to talk about the the other option that uh, some people don't prescribe to, they don't uh, they don't uh, subscribe to, they don't um, necessarily believe in, but what I want to submit to you is I think there's some merit to this, and that is uh, fallen angels. So our other option is the belief that the giants are the result of the sons of God being fallen angels that took wives of the daughters of men. Again, some folks don't don't subscribe to this, and I understand, but <clears throat> uh, there's arguments for and against, and let's deal with one or more of those arguments. Well, one of the arguments of this teaching is that angels cannot marry which I understand people, where they get that from. Uh, but let's start with that objection. Jesus told his audience in his day that those in the resurrection would neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are, this, are as the angels in heaven. And some people will go to this. Those that subscribe to the uh, Godly line of Seth will go to this and they'll say, well, see, see, they can't marry, so there's no way this could have happened. Look at Matthew chapter number 22. So let's go and look at that passage and let's talk about that. Matthew 22 and verse number 23. Matthew 22, 23. Verse number 23 says, The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, If a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Well, let me say this. These Sadducees are talking about the resurrection. They don't even believe in the resurrection themselves. Hypocritical. And Christ knew that. But he answers the question. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And so, some will say, well see, because they're as the angels of God in heaven, then they, there's no way the angels could have married these women. But did you notice a very important part of that answer. And that answer was, as the angels which are in heaven. The angels in heaven don't marry, but did it say that if they weren't in heaven they couldn't marry? And that that's the thing you've got to notice is that what if they weren't in heaven, could they then marry and be given in marriage? The answer I, I say is yes, there's a, that possibility. Now, um, uh, go ahead and uh, that next reference is off. Uh, I missed a I missed the uh, what I was looking for, but notice that the Lord is careful to add in heaven. In heaven they are spirits. However, when they appear on earth, they always appear as men. Uh, so much for you know women with wings and long hair and we we won't even go into that right now. But the only place you see female creatures with wings is in the Minor Prophets and they're toting something and they're, they're not a good thing. They're actually a, they're an evil thing. Every time you see angels in, in, in the Bible, they always appear as young men without wings. You see that with Sodom and Gomorrah when, when the two men, the two came into the city and Lot saw them. You see that with Mary when she's confronted by Gabriel. You see that with Michael. You don't see them the way people draw them today. I think what people draw today really hails from the minor prophets where you see these creatures that are that are not a good thing. And so you have the two angels that rescued Lot out of Sodom. I have that there. We won't turn there for sake of time. It's where by the, they were sought by the, the men of Sodom, the Sodomites of, of Sodom, as men who came in thee by night, so that they might know them. Genesis 19.5. Why else do you see them seeking out those men? They to, to them, they looked like men. They wanted them. That's what they wanted. 
This does not prove that such a union was possible, but it does prove that the angels looked and acted like men. The pattern of calling angels men in the Bible is so common that it's not even necessary to pile the proof up. Like we don't we don't have to turn to all the passages. Just look for it. It's there. In the Bible, you never see an angel with wings or as a woman. Angels are spirits, Psalm 104, verse 4. But when they appear on earth, they take on the form of a male body. That is, it. I mean, we know that the angels there, they actually took hold of Lot and his family and pulled them out. So they had to have a physical body to do that. So if they have a physical body, then it makes sense they can do physical things with it. In fact, they will even eat because we see the angels that met with Abram had a meal provided by him when the Lord appeared to... Let's turn there because I want you to see this. Sodom and Gomorrah is very common, but the chapter before, when God is visiting Abraham and telling him about what's going to happen to Sodom, they eat a meal with him. Genesis 18, um, look at, um, let's start in verse number 6. It says there, And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran into the herd, and fetched a calf tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed, and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said unto her, and said, Behold, in the tent. So we won't go any further because the point we're trying to make is right here. They did eat. So they ate. Apparently they can grab hold of something because, again, in Genesis 19, they grab hold of Lot when, and, you know, they're, they're, uh, Lot and his family are just, they're not moving. The, the, the angels have said, look, you got to get out of here. you got to get out of here. And they don't want to do it. So they grab hold of them and physically take them out of the city. And so we see they can do physical things. The biblical use of the sons of God is found in this. The phrase sons of God is found five times in the Old Testament. Two times in Genesis 6 and three times in the book of Job. So if we want to build an even greater case, turn, if you will, to Job chapter 1. So the sons of God, the sons of God. So we see angels, we see what they can do, we see, we see uh, the sons of God, the sons of God here in Genesis 6, but look at Job chapter 1 and look at verse number 6 when you get over there. Job 1.6 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now, number one, you see, it's been said that you're known by the company you keep. I don't, I don't think these sons of God were necessarily good because you have Satan among them. It appears that they have to come and report before God. And Satan apparently does too, which is a whole other conversation. So you have these sons of God. You have them in Job 1. You have them in Job 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. He's doing the same thing they are. So it's interesting that you see them showing up in these passages. But there's another place sons of God show up, and that's in Job 38. Listen, when I first heard all this, it, it blew my mind. And so if this is the first time for you to hear this, it, this is going to cause questions. It's going to arise in your, in, your, in your mind, and that's okay. But when you finally look and you digest what's going on and you see these verses... There's more evidence for this than there is for, well, the godly line of Seth. Are these princes? There's no record of that. But there's record of this. Look at Job 38. Look at verse number 7. This is at creation. When the Lord's answering Job, and he tells, Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where was you? And so, we, again, some of this we've dealt with, but I'm, I'm making these connections now. 
Job 38, verse number 7, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now you have the sons of God here. We talked about this in, in when we dealt with Genesis chapter 1, but now we're dealing with what some of, with some of, at least some of these sons of God have done in Genesis chapter 6. And I think that's where you see the corruption. You have these fallen angels, you have these sons of God that have now come into the daughters of men and because there's something different about them, because they have greater powers, when they have children, some of that's passed on to these children and you see them. I remember, um, I remember in a class that I took many years ago now, the comment was made, and I don't have it in the notes here tonight, but I want you to think about something. It, it, this isn't going to be on a quiz. This isn't th nothing like that. But I want you to think about something, because it was presented to me when I when I took Genesis many years ago. If this is all true, and we've got verses to really back this up, folks, please. We live in a box. Man thinks he's the superior creation. He thinks he's great. We live in a box, and we think so highly of ourselves. But God has made some things that's just miraculous. It's just great. But where do you think, where do you think all these mythological gods and creatures have come from? And let that sink in for just a minute. Where do you think the Greeks and the Romans, and it's been passed down from generation, 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 where do you think some of these Hercules and Zeus and all these, all these names and these, these, these superhuman creatures came from? It's because of Genesis chapter 6. It's because, and then there also after that, Goliath, his brothers, his offspring. And finally it took David and others to just kill him off. And, and that's, that's, a, that's at least a theory of mine. I, I'm, I'm giving you scripture, and I, I truly believe it, at the least these giants are the offspring of these relationships. But doesn't it, doesn't it make sense that if they were around, that they influenced mythology? And they, they were like gods because they're fallen angels. So we see them at the time of creation. The phrase sons of God is found six times in the New Testament. We won't turn, again, we won't turn to all of this just for sake of time. But notice... All these times it's referring to someone being a son of God because they are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Every time in the New Testament, you have it in John 1, 12, where he gave power for us to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name. You have Romans 8, 14, where that you're a son of God. You have Philippians 2, 15. You have the son of God. In, uh, you have the son of God because of Jesus Christ. You have, you're a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that you're a son of God. Those are the, the, we become a son of God, not these, we become a son of God when we believe on Jesus Christ. You have a son of, you have the son of God, that's Adam. Notice that Adam was the son of God because he was created by him. Luke 3, verse number 38. We've already dealt with that, I think, last week, where he, which was the Son of God. Adam, he's a Son of God. You have Christ is the Son of God because of his relationship to the Father, according to John 10, 36. That's all in the New Testament. So every time in the New Testament, you either, you've got someone that's saved, they're a child of God, they're a Son of God because of their salvation. You have Adam that's mentioned because he was created by God. And then you also have Jesus Christ because he is the Son of God. But you have those three in the New Testament. But when Adam had his son Seth, the Bible is clear to state that Seth was born in the likeness of Adam after his image. Seth had no right to be called the Son of God by natural birth, and neither do his descendants, because we lost that. And we dealt with that last week. So we won't deal with that right now. As Christians today, we've had a spiritual birth, Therefore, we can be called the sons of God. So what about the angels? The angels were created by God, so they get that name. They were present with God in Job 38.7. So what are the results of this corruption? 
Genesis 6, 4 through 5. Let's go back and read that again because we've been some time away from it. Genesis 6, 4 through 5 says, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the result is the, there's corruption. There, one, the seed is corrupted. But there is a line. And we'll talk more about Noah and his sons next week. But there's a line. And that line is through Noah and his sons that's not corrupt. The seed is not corrupted. And also they're, they're holy. They, the, of all the people... And it's sad, you would think there'd be more people because remember, here's the thing. Even the line of Seth, you got sons and daughters are born to them. Sons and daughters are born to them. Not everyone's mentioned, but there's more people being born. But apparently they're not righteous or they don't want to hear Noah. It says, the New Testament says, Noah, the preacher of the God, a, a preacher, he preached that judgment's coming, judgment's coming. No one listened. You'll have Noah and his sons and his wife. And his son's wives. That's it. And so we have the sons of God. Are, the sons of God are producing giants. The sons of God were attracted to the daughters of men and took wives of their choosing. From these unions came children that were giants and men of renown. When they did, what they did was especially perverse in the sight of God. Listen, it wasn't just the wickedness. This was perverse to God. It wasn't supposed to happen. It wasn't supposed to take place. And this makes sense because, turn if you will to 2 Peter chapter 2 and notice the connections that's made in the New Testament. 2 Peter chapter number 2. I, again, I've dealt with this before, but I, I added a little bit more information even in these notes uh, this go around because I think you see some things. And notice the connection that's made in Scripture. Context, 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 folks. And there's without a doubt, there's a reason for the. The, the way things are laid out in your, in, in your Bible. 2 Peter 2, verse number 4, it says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved in judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. When did he do that? Well, he had the 120 years. He was preaching that there was a flood coming, judgment's coming, you need to get right bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly and deliver just lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Now notice something. I went a little bit further, but notice the context. Why does the Lord put these angels that sinned, cast them down to hell and deliver them in the chains of darkness, Right with how with Noah and spared Noah being just. There's a reason for that because it takes place right there, very close. Now I know there's a there's a pause in ver between verse five and verse six, but God's doing some things here, and there's a reason for all of this. So we see, in fact, the angels are mentioned again in Jude, where they kept not their first estate but left their own habitation. Look at Jude, and isn't it interesting that. 2 Peter 2 and Jude are very close. They closely resemble each other. Notice Jude, verse number 6. Notice here. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. And he compares it to verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, Number one, fornication, but then later, and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So God makes this connection here. This would match perfectly with Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Their first habitation was heaven, but they left it to inhabit earth and take the daughters of men as their wives. And remember that whenever angels come to earth, they come in the form of male beings, of male mankind. They're men. They can eat. They can, they can take hold. I mean, they took hold of, of, of Lot and his family. It makes sense then that what could have occurred 
was that you have these angels, these fallen angels that had went with the devil, they had, they had rebelled against God, and they came, they fell, and they came to earth, and they intermingle with the seed of man. And let me just say this, that's part of Satan's plan. He's trying to stop God's plan of populating the earth the way he wanted to see fit. He wants to stop that line, that promised seed that's going to come. And this is, this is one point in history where the devil tries to mess this up. Another point is you've got Goliath that's going to battle against David. If Goliath can kill David, he's messed up the line. If Saul can kill David later, he's messed up the line. There, it makes sense that this could happen. Fallen angels are compared to Sodom and Gomorrah here. We saw that already. Notice, consider the verse in, Jude, uh, in, in the book of Jude, verse number 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner. There's this strange flesh. It's not of God. It's not of God. God compares what the angels did to fornication, to going after strange flesh, it wasn't supposed to be. It deals with Sodom and Gomorrah. He makes this connection. He makes that comparison in the passage. Now, their sin in Sodom was going after strange flesh. This is a man normally wants to marry... Normally, that is a man normally wants to marry a woman. When something is strange to you, it's foreign. It's not... That's not supposed to be. It was not normal for the angels to do or want to do this. It wasn't a normal thing. Sodom was judged because of its sexual perversion. Not just because they were ungrateful. Yes, that's true. They were. Hmm, what do you know? Today. Uh, but they had sexual perversion. In like manner, angels are not meant to marry or have relations with men or the women. They did, and it brought, it brought about strange beings, strange men to do as a perversion of their estate. Estate is something where you reside. It's yours. The perversion of this divine order brought the judgment of God. This union of the sons of God and the daughters of men created a line of people, giants, that were men of renown and may I say superhuman. Now, this is interesting because this, this brings up some things that I just want to at least touch on and mention. They excelled your normal man. Hollywood, and we'll deal with imaginations in just a minute, but Hollywood are creating all these superhuman beings. They're creating all these characters that, can, that, are, that, that are brought by these super people. I haven't watched everything. What little bit I have, it's been many years ago, but I've only seen clips and bits and pieces, and I can tell you right now, Thor's hammer and all these things. Doesn't that make sense that we're conditioning our minds and our hearts to accept this stuff. And boy, if it comes about, wow, I'm excited. I'm just, I'm just going to mention something. And I find it very, very interesting that you're going to see some things in the future that are going to line up with what you see in the past. And we'll deal with that in just a minute. Notice again Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 4. There were in those days and also after that. So, in other words, there were giants in the days of Noah, but also after the days of Noah, one will see giants again. We saw it in the Old Testament with David. We saw it when the people came in to take the land. But I believe, I believe that you're going to see it again. We saw the sons of Anak and the giants in the promised land in Numbers 13, 32-33. This explains the size and claims found in Genesis with Abraham, Numbers and Deuteronomy with Moses, but the book of Joshua with Joshua, and 1 Samuel with David and the nation of Israel. The script, let me just say this. The scriptural approach and the answers that presents the facts as we have them from the Bible is that the sons of God are fallen angels, that they came to know the daughters of men, and from those unions came children that were giants and men of renown. This is the only approach that we can see from Scripture that makes sense. Now let me say this. We see the wickedness and heart of man in this passage. Notice verse number 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 
Folks, if we're ever in a time where we're headed, we're headlong, we're like on, we're like on a speeding train or on a bobsled that's been greased up and it's head downhill and it's going fast. We are headed to that time. We're, we're there, but we're going further and further into darkness of that time. We are headed for that. So as the days of Noe, Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Look at Matthew 24 with me. I just want to present you something and we'll be done tonight. Not only do we see the wickedness and the perversion of man in the days of Noah, not only do we see that the devil tried to mess up some things with the seed that was there, but we also see it with David and he had to battle giants in the land. But I present to you that those things are coming back. They will come back. And look at Matthew 24 with me, if you will. Matthew 24, verse number 37. But as the days of Noah, that's Noah, were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. I'm not going to read all of it for sake of time. Some people will go to this and say, well, look, see, the rapture is going to happen. Because see, there's going to be two at the meal, and one's going to be, there's going to be two in the field, and one's going to be taken the other left. That's not what that's talking about. Matthew 24, Matthew 24 is talking about the judgment of God. It's talking about the tribulation early on. It's talking about all the things that are going to happen. In fact, verse 29 of Matthew 24 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. This is a Jewish audience. This is dealing with the Jews. This is dealing with a time. He's telling the apostles. He's telling those that are listening to him, this is what's going to happen. But may I present to you that verse 37, it says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. What was going on? Well, not only are people wicked, they're downright wicked, but also you have perversion of mankind. That's coming back. In fact, you already see the grip of people experimenting with things, but I think it's going to... I think the ante is going to be turned up when the church is raptured out. The blessed hope, the catching away, when the church is taken out, you're going to see things that you've never seen before that's going to happen in this earth. And there are going to be things that are come out of the earth. We, don't, we won't turn to them right now. But the book of Revelation talks about there's going to be those, that, there's going to be creatures that are going to be let out of the bottomless pit that's going to go and it's going to bite men. Men are going to try to look for death. They can't find it. They're going to be, have a face of a man, but they're going to have the body of, of an animal. Listen, it's going to be weird. Weird stuff. We think everything we're facing right now is strange. This is kindergarten. This is prep time. This is We're preparing. But what's going to happen after this is going to be greater. And may I present to you that I think these sons of God are coming back. How they're going to get here, I don't know. But they're going to show up and they're going to mingle with the ma mankind and it, it, there's going to be some weird things that are going to take place or they're just going to show up whether they mingle or not. They're going to be superhuman. You've heard of Superman? Fun to watch. It, you, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's going to be interesting. The sun will come in judgment. Notice in our passage... Matthew 24, verse number 39. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So when the Son of Man shows up, they're, they're going to be taken away. And again, this isn't rapture. This is later. Compare this over to Revelation 19, folks. Revelation 19, because I good, good fundamentalists say, yep, there's the rapture. He's going to catch us away. No, that... Hmm. You got you, you got your time frame messed up. Matthew 24 is a warning to the Jew. It's a warning to those people standing on the mount. Oh, when this happens, run for the hills. Revelation 19, look at verse number 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man but he himself. 
and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies, that's us, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He's treading the winepress. He's killing his enemies. One will be taken, the other left. He's, he's rooting out the wickedness. That's what's going on here. Verse 16, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, To all the fowls of that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together into the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and him that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. No one's left out. Those that have stood against God that received, that, that received the mark, that did all this, they're going to be rooted out. And then God's going to set up a thousand-year reign. Christ, the Son of God, is going to set up a thousand-year reign on the earth that he might rule and reign for that length of time on the earth. And so this, that's what we see here. The Son will come in judgment. Now, let me talk about this. The imagination of man's heart is only evil. The word imagination occurs 14 times in Scripture, and it is associated with the heart of man. The heart of man. Uh, turn over to Jeremiah, if you will. Jeremiah chapter number 3. Jeremiah chapter number 3. Again, we won't be too much longer, and this should be shorter tonight, but uh, we, we, want to, we want to make sure that we cover these things. Jeremiah 3, look at verse number 17 with me. It says, At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it to the name of the Lord to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. This is when Christ is ruling and reigning on, on, on the throne in the city of Jerusalem. Notice, And neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. Isn't it interesting that you see imagination or imaginations in Genesis 6 and then after these days, after all these things, after the seven years of tribulation, after the Lord comes and, and judges, you have neither shall they walk anymore after the imagination of their evil heart. Two things. One, you see the connection and how bad man is. And he's going after everything that he can think of in his heart. But also, you see the practicality of this that man's heart is full of imagination, imaginations that are evil. I, imagination is, is connected to image. What do you see? Devices, TVs, man puts things up that he paints an image in his mind and he puts it on the screen. You, you see where this can go? Look at Jeremiah 7, verse number 24. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their heart, ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. Talking about those that had obeyed not the voice of God. Look at Jeremiah 9, verse number 14. Jeremiah 9, 14. But have walked after the imagination of their own heart and after Balaam, which their fathers taught them. Again, imagination. Imagination and imaginations... Uh, uh, Imagination occurs 14 times in Scripture, and more so than not, most occurrences are in a negative connotation. That is, it's connected to something that's wrong. The word imaginations occurs six times in Scripture. The plural form of the word is no different. It's associated with the heart and wickedness of man. And you even see it in the New Testament. You see it in Proverbs, in the Old Testament, then you see it in Romans 1, 21. That's where God talks about how they went after the imaginations of their heart and, and God gave them over to it. You see it in, in 2 Corinthians 10, verse number 5. Folks, more, time and time again, you see that mankind, even mankind, when he's left to himself, goes wicked. Why? Because he has this sin nature. But what I, what I also, you see in Genesis 6, what helps that along is that the devil gets involved, you have the sons of God, they come into the daughters of men, and they, 
they, their offspring are mighty men, men of renown, these giants. And God said, I have got to stop this because it's going to totally destroy the plan I have for mankind. And I have to stop it. And how does he stop it? He sends a flood. Then we see those come again. Once again, you see them show back up and you have these giants in the days of David, the days of Saul, the days of Joshua, and they have to eradicate it. And what's going to happen? May I submit to you, I believe what's going to happen based upon what we see in Scripture, they're, they're going to show up again in the time of the tribulation and they're going to show up and they're going to, they're going to show up and help in some form or fashion, I think, in some way. They're going to help the, 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 the Antichrist, the beast, and then God's going to say, you know what, enough's enough. Man in his own wrath, man's wrath, my wrath, the time of Jacob's trouble, I'm finally coming, I'm going to save my people, and I'm going to fix this. But, of course, he's going to have his thousand-year reign, and finally he's going to have to set everything straight. But, but that is what we see, the connections we see in Genesis chapter 6 right there. And next time what we'll do is we'll get into... The rest of chapter 6, we're going to talk about how the Lord, it repented the Lord that he had made men on the earth. It grieved him at his heart. We bring God grief in all this. He said, I'm going to destroy, but, uh, but yet I'm going to, Noah finds grace in God's sight. And he says, you know what? I'm going to start with Noah and his three sons to repopulate the earth and to start this afresh and do some things and give man a chance at living for me. Again, a lot to cover. I, I know not a lot of verses, but a lot of information. And so for some of you, you've probably heard this before, but for some of you, it's probably like, well, let me pull this back in. And I've, got to, I've got to think about this. I've got to ponder on this. And I understand that. What we'll do is next week, you'll have a quiz over everything from page 45 through page 50. Uh, we'll have our quiz over what we've covered tonight. Uh, thank you so much for if you've stayed with me all this time. I know, again, it was heavy for some of you, I'm sure. Others, again, it was probably something you've heard before. But thank you for staying with me. I pray God blesses you. And uh, thank you for the, for the night. And uh, be safe. If you're watching this and you've got to travel home, be safe getting home. But thank you for this evening. May God richly bless you as you continue to serve and strive to serve Him.